Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. We're in lockdown once again, but it is a privilege to be able to broadcast the Word of God. And I do pray that as we gather around God's Word tonight, we'll know a sense of His presence and His voice even speaking to our hearts. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Let's hear God's Word. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. And build up thy throne to all generations, Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, Thou hast founded them. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, and strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favour our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defence, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Amen. We end the reading there at verse number 18. We trust God a lot of blessing to the reading of his precious and holy word. Let's pray for his help tonight. Our gracious heavenly father, we thank thee for the word of truth. We thank thee that this is a living word. We thank you, Lord, that thy word uh, can be applied to our hearts tonight, that we can hear the spirit of God saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. We pray that will be the reality tonight, that Lord, above the voice of the preacher, will hear the voice of God. Lord, speak to us, we pray, how we need a word in season at this time. Lord, encourage thy people. Bless us, we pray. Give us this opportunity, Lord, just to hear thee speak and direct us in the way in which we ought to go. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. And give me help to deliver the word of God that thou hast given to me for the glory and honour of thy name and the blessing of the people of God. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen. Amen. Psalm, psalm 89 is the psalm of a believer in a time of national disaster and turning away from God. In spite of the difficulties that are detailed in this psalm, the penman commences with this affirmation in verse number one. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. C.H. Spurgeon, when he studied this psalm, gave an outline that I want to share with you just now. In verses 1 through 4, he affirms, the psalmist affirms his faith in the Lord, and he remembers especially the covenant that the Lord made with David. In verses 5 through 14, he details the greatness of God. He includes his power, his justice, and his mercy. And one of the results of the greatness of God ought to be, verse 7, that God is greatly to be feared, reverenced or respected in the assembly of the saints. 
and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Our God is so great and wonderful, it should uh, dictate the way that we come before him, the way that God has ordained, a way of righteousness and a way that's pleasing to him. In verses 15 through 18, we have the happiness of the people who have this God as their God and as their defence. In verses 19 through 37, he details the covenant that was made with David and some of the wonderful promises that were made within that covenant. In verses 38 to 51, he mournfully pours out his heart before God at the state of the land, at the state, spiritual state of the people, and there's complaint and there is petition. And then in verse number 52, in the closing verse, he gives the benediction and a double amen. And in that verse, it says, blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Humanly speaking, at this time, it seemed like the promises of God would not or could not be fulfilled. The state of the land their carelessness towards the Lord and his standing back as he allows them to face the consequences of their sins. And yet in the midst of it all, in the midst of this difficult time and the time that seemed hopeless, the psalmist remembers and reaffirms the faithfulness of God. His God is faithful and God is still faithful today. He is the unchanging one. He cannot fail. And though human eyes cannot always see, God is always working. His purposes are coming to pass and he is doing all things well. It's significant that the heart chooses to believe God in the midst of these difficult times. But not only does the psalmist choose to believe God, but he promises to declare the faithfulness of God to all generations even to the generations to come. And even in a world that's full of chaos and confusion, in a world where there's so many different messages being proclaimed, we have a duty as the people of God to proclaim the faithfulness of God to all generations, to young and to old, to the generation that will follow us. We ought to be faithful and proclaim God as he is revealed to us in scripture. I want us to look at two verses that speak about Four truths describing the blessed people of God. Verses 15 and 16, they say, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. The first thing I want us to do before we really delve into these verses is to explain to you what the word blessed means. It's very important that we have an understanding of that. This word blessed in scripture in the original means happy. In fact, it's the thought of how happy. And the idea is that happiness is abounding through the life of this particular person. Now, whenever we look at the makeup of the word in Hebrew, it's interesting to note that it comes from a word which means to be straight or to be level or to be right. And the idea is that if someone is going the straight way, someone's walking on the level path, someone's walking on the right path, then there is happiness and there is a blessing for them. And that's right. Whenever we're right before God, whenever we walk straight down the road that he has prepared for us, when we do what is right before him, then we are blessed. There's no doubt about that. The psalmist said, trust, or the hymn writer said, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The word in the Hebrew figuratively means to go forward, to be honest and to prosper. And once again, when we are going through with God, when we're walking in his paths, when we're honest before God, when we're doing that which is proper before God, then there is that blessing for obedience. And we thank God that we can rejoice in him. There's no happier person than the person who knows their God and who is walking with their God. So what is it specifically in these verses that makes a person blessed or happy? Well, there's four things that I want you to notice. First of all, in verse number 15, it says, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. 
And therefore, the first mark of this blessed person is that they know the joyful sound. Now, this uh, phrase and this statement, the joyful sound, takes us back to some of the verses in the Old Testament that have already gone before the Psalms. And they're in uh, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse number 24. We read these words. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And therefore we see in this instance that there was a joyful sound, a sound of trumpets that was being made. It was a time to rest from the normal menial tasks of life and to come before the Lord with sacrifice and with thanksgiving. The word is also translated in different ways. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and in verse number 5, we read these words. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And that little phrase, great shout, is the same that is translated here, a joyful sound. We read elsewhere in Leviticus that the trumpet sounds here and there for different times. For example, the sound was made whenever it was the start of a new festival or the start of a new feast or the start of a new time to offer sacrifice unto the Lord. And therefore, the trumpet sound or the joyful sound is connected with worship. Not only that, but this sound was heralded forth at a time of battle. And before the people went into battle, as they were marching into battle, and then, of course, in the time of victory. And therefore, we can think that the trumpet was sounding in the time of battle. That was the time of obedience as they went at the command of God to fight against their enemies. The trumpet also sounded in times of celebration, and that was praise unto the Lord. And therefore, whenever they heard this joyful sound, when they heard the trumpet sounding forth, or when there was a great celebration in the camp, one of three things was happening. Either the people were coming uh, at the sound of the trumpet to the place of sacrifice, coming with repentance and faith, or they were coming at the sound of a battle, marching in the name of the Lord with their trust and faith in the Lord in obedience to him. Or it was a time whenever the victory had come or whenever great joy or celebration was found in the camp, a joyful sound was raised up in the midst of the people. If you turn with me to Numbers chapter 10, there is a very interesting passage that speaks to us of the joyful sound in the camp of Israel. And we want to read there from Numbers chapter 10, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. When they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is a wonderful picture of the word of God. You see there in verse number two that there are two trumpets of silver and yet they're made out of the one piece of metal. And that's a lovely picture of the word of God. Here we have the Old and the New Testament, but essentially the one book, it is of the one uh, source, it is from the Lord. And as a trumpet sounds forth a noise, so too the word of God sounds forth the message of the gospel, the good news of salvation, both in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. You'll find there in verse 2 that the trumpet is used for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And isn't it wonderful that whenever we bring God's people together, should it be physically in the church building or in this way as we come around the Internet or the DVD and we hear the word of God, we are coming together to hear the word of God, the truth of God being heralded forth. But also God's word is for our journeying. And not only are we to assemble together to hear the word of God proclaimed, we are also to journey in obedience to the word of God. And as we listen to the word and read the word, it will instruct us in the way in which we ought to go. It's interesting to note in verse number eight, 
and the sons of Aaron the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generation. And it was the priests, those specifically who had a ministry among the people that were to blow the trumpet. And likewise, the Lord has called people to be pastors and teachers and evangelists of the word of God. And they have the responsibility of sounding forth the word as the people gather to hear. In verse number nine, it says, And if ye go out to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then shall ye blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. And also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. Verse number nine speaks about the trumpet being blown in war and then verse number 10 the trumpet being blown in the time of peace and should it be a difficult day or an easy day should you be in the day of battle or in a day where there is uh, peace and prosperity all around you the word of God is always applicable just as the trumpet was to sound in every time uh, and every different experience of the Israelites wanderings so too the word of God is to be had and read and obeyed in every single aspect and avenue of life. And the word of God says in Psalm 89 verse 15, happy are those who know the joyful sound. And the joyful sound that we have is indeed the word of God. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know by faith and have experienced by faith these truths. We know those of us who are saved that the Lord Jesus Christ is a substitute for sinners, that his blood was shed to set us free. We know the promises of God. We know who we are in Christ. We know that God is sovereign and truths such like that as we hear them and as we read them and as we learn them and pray over them, we will be a blessed and a happy people. And the question therefore has to be asked to every believer, what are you listening to today? What is it that's going into your heart, that's going into your ears, going into your mind? What do you allow your mind to be filled with? Because only God's word can truly give peace and contentment, satisfaction and joy to the Christian. And sometimes Christians lose out on the blessing that there is in being found in the word of God. They leave it to the side. They fill their ears with the news broadcasts and with the, with the things that they hear on the internet and with television, all of those things, and they neglect the word of God. God's word should be the thing that we go to, to receive our daily food, to receive the blessing of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, that the joy of the Lord might be our strength. We sing with the boys and girls in Sunday school and children's meetings, oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And we ought to be careful what we listen to. We ought to be careful what we read and may the Lord give us a great hunger for the word of God that that will be the thing that will bring great joy and blessing in our lives. This is what God has ordained. We shall know the joyful sound, the truths that God has hurled it through his word, that we will hear them, that we will read them, believe them and rejoice in them. But then there's a second feature of the blessed man or woman. Not only will they know the joyful sound, but in verse number 15, they shall walk. O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. And not only do they hear the word of God, but they put it into practice by walking in obedience before the Lord. This verse is essentially teaching that the one who's walking in the word of God will enjoy the gracious presence of the Lord, communion with God, the comforts of the Holy Spirit, the smile of God will be a reality upon their lives as they walk before his countenance, literally, before his face. We are to walk in Christ and we are to walk with Christ. And we have light to walk and we have the light of his presence. We have the light of his word. But there's also a great joy in the light of his countenance. And the believer is marked by this life that he is walking in the light of God. He rejects the dark deeds and the dark activities of this world and the dark attitudes because he has been saved from darkness and brought into the light of the gospel. 
And this has always been the call of God to his people to walk in the light. For example, in Isaiah 2 verse 5, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And therefore, even in the Old Testament, we have this idea of walking in light, walking in truth. First John uh, 1 verse 7, but if ye walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And therefore, there is that uh, calling upon the child of God to walk in the light. And in doing so, we can have fellowship one with the other. And that's one of the remarkable things that will be a testimony to the unsaved. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that ye have loved one toward another. And we cannot have loved one toward another if we're not walking in the word and we're not walking with the Lord. When we think of the word walk, it reminds us of progress. If you walk any distance at all, you will no longer be where you started. You'll be some distance away. And the Lord wants us to walk with him. We are not to dwell and be in the same place that we always have been, spiritually speaking. But we are to go on with God. We're to make progress just a little further every single day. But not only does the word walk remind us of progress, it reminds us of a purpose. We're not walking aimlessly, but we're walking according to the word and the will of God. God has a purpose for your life and a purpose for mine. Now, if we're walking with him, we're fulfilling that purpose and how wonderful that is. And what blessing there is for us when we do that. But if we are not walking with God, then we are not fulfilling that purpose in our life. And how sad to look over a life of wasted years, wasted days, wasted months, maybe even wasted years. Dear believer, it's essential to walk in the light. So this walking talks of a progress, it talks of purpose, but it also speaks of the fact that we need power. And nobody can walk in the light of the Lord without the power of God. We cannot live lives that bring glory to God and we cannot live lives in our own strength of obedience to him. But thank God every morning we can come before the Lord and say, Lord, give me the strength to walk for you today. Give me power to walk well before you today. And the Lord has promised that if we ask or seek or knock, as we learned on the Lord's day, then the Lord will give good things to them that ask him. So we found the first two things that identify the blessed man or the blessed woman. They know the joyful sound or they know what the word of God says and they walk in the light of his countenance. But the third thing is found in verse number 16. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day. They rejoice in the Lord. And that is a mark of the believer. That's one of the things that identifies them. We can think about this phrase, rejoice in the Lord. And it's found many times in scripture. Let me highlight just a few. For example, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. And we concluded our study in Philippians just uh, last week. But in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And in this particular verse, verse number 16, they rejoice all the day. So at all times of the day, in all days of our lives, in all seasons of our lives, whether we're children, teenagers, adults who are coming into senior years, we ought to be rejoicing in the Lord. Not only at all times, but in Psalm 33, verse 1, it says, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. The word comely, it means it's suitable, it's appropriate, it's beautiful. It's something that you do that brings glory to the Lord. And therefore, not only are we to praise him at all times, it's part of our duty and privilege as a Christian to praise the Lord. We have the privilege of coming into the presence of God and worshipping him, praising him for who he is and for what he has done. And indeed, these, that's what our next few verses will remind us. Psalm 97 verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord ye righteous and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. We can praise the Lord and rejoice in him today because we're not coming wondering how we will find the Lord. We're not coming wondering what his character will be today. But we know that he is always holy. We know that he is always righteous. He is always good. He's always faithful. He's always true. We can fully and wholly depend upon him. So we praise him at all times as part of our duty and privilege. We praise him for who he is, but we also praise him and rejoice in him for what he has done. And in Isaiah 61 verse 10, 
We read these words, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And whenever we consider all of these different uh, verses, or some of the ones in scripture that speak about rejoice in the Lord, we realize that it's linked to who God is and it's linked to what the Lord has done. You see, if you're saved tonight, you have much to thank and praise the Lord for. Our circumstances change, but he does not. We are called to engage in this activity continually because we can never lose our salvation and God can never lose his people. And all that we need in our lives is found in him. And therefore, we've much to rejoice in. Should we even be coming to the valley of the shadow of death, we can still rejoice in him because he has promised to be faithful and he will be with us and he will bring us through safely to the other side. I love that hymn. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And the last verse of that hymn says, Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your heart and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find, none other is so lovely, so good and kind. And we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 48 verse 14, For this God is our God forever and ever and he will be our guide even unto death. Isn't it wonderful we have an unchanging God, one who loves us and cares for us, one who will provide everything that we need, one who knows what we're going through, one who sympathizes with us, one who's promised to never leave us or never forsake us. Oh we ought to be rejoicing today. You know sometimes things don't go our way and we get maybe grumpy when we start to complain about things as if we deserve or as if we're owed something all the time forgetting that the lord's in control of it all the lord's working out his purposes and his ways are not always our ways and his thoughts are not always our thoughts and therefore we ought to continue to praise him in all circumstances whether we understand or not god is always good and praise god He's always faithful. And then we come to the final attribute of the blessed person. And it says there in verse number 16. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. And here we find that the believer is looking forward to something that is going to happen in the future. And I believe that this fourth attribute is this. They believe that the best is yet to be. Now, every believer has been exalted in the righteousness of Christ. We've been raised from enemies to become children of God. We have been raised from the depths of guilt to be able to stand in his righteousness. We're no longer slaves, but we're now free because of Christ and through his righteousness. But what a glorious, blessed hope there is for the Christian just up ahead. You see, the promises of God are true and dependable. Therefore, I can face the rest of the day. I can face tomorrow rejoicing and hoping for God's best. God is faithful. We're on the winning side. The best is yet to be. Of course, ultimately, that will be in heaven whenever God's best is given to us in its entirety. And we experience the joys and the glories of heaven. Ah, but there are many blessings still to be experienced here as long as the Lord allows us to live here. There are many victories to be won. There are more souls to be reached with the gospel. There are more uh, pews to be filled in our churches. Oh, there's so much more ground to be taken for the Lord. And therefore, part of the hope of the people of God is that the best is yet to be. Yes, we know the word of God and we walk in the light of his word. And yes, of course, we rejoice in the Lord. And in doing all those things, then that hope will be within our heart. Oh, there's more to come. The Lord is going to bless us again. And therefore, every believer in prayer should always thank the Lord for what he has done. And praise him for what he is going to do. As I finish tonight, I want to ask you a question. 
Are you blessed tonight? Are you happy tonight in your walk with the Lord? Are these things a reality in your life? Maybe there's one or two or a few of these things that you're lacking in. Well, I encourage you tonight to consider what these verses say. Blessed or happy is the people that know the joyful sound. Get into the word of God. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Walk obediently with God. And in thy name shall they rejoice all the day. Praise God and rejoice much in who God is and what he's done. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Believe and look for the great blessings of God that he has promised to them that love him. Oh, there's greater things to come. May the Lord bless us as we meet around his throne of grace and prayer. We can't be together physically, but our voices can join together in prayer. And as this broadcast comes to a close, we encourage you just to take that time in your home and to ask for the Lord to come and to bless us even as individuals, in our families, as a church family and in this land. Oh, we need the Lord. There's no doubt about that. And praise God, we're coming to the one who's promised to hear and answer our cry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee and we praise thee for the privilege of studying thy word tonight. And Lord, what an encouragement this has been to my soul to realise that here are some things that we can look for in our lives and put into practice in our lives. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have been so uh, void of joy or hope or or even the times we haven't read the word of God, even those times we haven't been obedient to thee. Lord, forgive us for our waywardness, our wanderings, our coldness. And put within our hearts tonight a great longing and hunger for the blessing of God. Oh Lord, we thank thee for the things that you've done for us already. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you we can watch this online tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can broadcast and get the word of God out into this old world. But we praise you, Lord, most of all that we are thine tonight. Do we know for sure it's well with our soul because of that day and hour when we turn from our sin and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, resting upon his finished work and knew that cleansing in the blood. We pray, Lord, you'll keep us a faithful people, keep us a holy people, or keep us walking with thee. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'll keep us obedient to thy truth and much in thy word. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to rejoice in our God. O oh Lord, you're worthy of so much praise. And Lord, how often we neglect it. O oh Lord, help us to be a people who praise our God. And then, Lord, we're looking forward. Give us hearts of expectation. As we pray, Lord, for revival to come, give us hearts to believe it will come. As we pray for loved ones to be saved, give us hearts of faith to believe that they will be saved. Lord, we're not wasting time in prayer, but Lord, we are praying to thee and knowing that thou can hear and answer prayer. Bless, Lord, our land tonight. Oh, what a state it's in, Lord. Much fear and confusion, Lord. Uh, much fighting, Lord. Uh, much hopelessness, we find this all around. But we pray, O oh Lord, that tonight thou wilt be pleased, Lord, to move afresh. We think of those, Lord, who have grown cold. We pray you'll revive them again tonight. Think of those, Lord, who came through Sunday schools and youth fellowships and even used to attend church and no longer have any time for the things of God. Think of those, Lord, who once walked well with thee and are no longer faithful. And yet, Lord, we think of those who are struggling tonight. We think of those, Lord, of thy people and the pressure is just so heavy with these things that are happening at this time. And Lord, whatever the spirit you'll need be, whatever the need of the hour be, will you come and, Lord, speak in this land again. Revive thy people, we pray. Oh, Lord, bring back people to the place of blessing. Oh, Lord, speak to our unsaved families and friends and loved ones. Remember our church, Lord, why we can't meet together, Lord, will you keep us faithful? Oh, Lord, keep each one going on with thyself. We long for the days when we can open up, Lord, and get as many people into that building as possible and sing praises, Lord, without any restrictions. And until that day, Lord, keep us faithful. We're looking forward to it. We believe it will come. And we pray, Lord, that you'll just help us be faithful, Lord, in these days, in these circumstances, that we can help with such things as we have. Remember our government tonight, Lord, give them wisdom. Uh, Lord, they're in a very difficult position. Few know what to do, but we pray, Lord, that you will lead them in the way in which they ought to go. I do pray, Lord, that you'll be pleased to stop wicked laws being passed in our land and, Lord, bring, in to, pa bring to pass laws that will be in accordance with thy word. Thank you for those who watch online, maybe not uh, able to come to your congregation physically, but they watch in. And we thank you for this and we pray this will be a great blessing to them tonight. 
and that you will encourage them in their walk with thee. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful. Oh, Lord, may we see great things done in the days that lie ahead. And even in this time of prayer now, as God's people pray, Lord, that we'll know a real joy near thy presence. And Lord, just that assurance that thou art here and that to bless us. Go before us now, we pray. Oh, Lord, touch those you need to touch tonight. And give us a special time in prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen and amen. Thank you for watching tonight. We do remind you of the services on the Lord's Day. We're looking forward to having some of the Whitfield students along to minister on the Lord's Day. And I trust that will be a blessing to you. Do you remember those meetings in prayer? And we trust that we will see you very soon.